and the cap and trade, the things that Congress talks about, they're, they're talking, you know, our Congress is well oiled in a coal fire. And they, they, uh, when they try to design a system, it's basically one which suits the lobbyists, the big banks and the fossil fuel industry. So what we need is one that's designed for the public. And it's also, you know, cap and trade, which is what they talked about. There's no way to make cap and trade global. There's no chance that China will accept a cap on their economy. They flat out said that, and there's no reason that they should. Their contribution to the excess CO2 in the atmosphere is 10 times smaller than that of the United States on a per capita basis. It's three, we're responsible for 27%, and they're responsible for 9%, and they've got three times as many people. Uh, so, but they have every reason to put a price on carbon because they don't want to be addicted to fossil fuels the way the United States is. And they would suffer from climate change more than most places. They have 300 million people living near sea level. They also have heavy air and water pollution. And they're smart enough to know that the countries that get out in front in the clean energy technology are going to be the ones which will have it to sell to the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, that, so I, and I don't want you to try to read this, but this is uh, something <laughs> written by Jim DePeso, who is, uh, I think, Executive Secretary for Republicans for the Environment. And he says that this uh, proposal that I just discussed makes use of market principles by prodding the market to tell the truth about the costs of carbon-based energy through prices. It would not impose mandates on consumers or businesses. It would not create new government agencies or add a penny to Uncle Sam's coffers. Fee and dividend uh, uh, how would it affect individuals? That would depend on how they exercise their right to make free choices. Businesses would seek out more opportunities to improve their energy efficiency. Other businesses would sell products and services that enable them to do so. Low carbon energy sources would be more competitive in high carb, with high carbon sources. And it's, he says it's transparent, market-based, does not create government does not enlarge government, leaves energy decisions to individual choices, takes a better safe than sorry approach to throttling back on heat trapping gases. Sounds like a conservative climate plan. But the problem is that we are up against um, people who prefer to continue business as usual. They're making a lot of money out of it, and uh, there are a lot more they seem to be a lot more effective at uh, communicating with the public than uh, scientists are. So what we have end up with is a case of potential intergenerational injustice. Way back, the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, talked about the responsibility of the current generation to leave. He was a farmer, and he said, you can't deplete the soils. You have to leave. Uh, soils that are in equally productive condition for the next generation. Uh, and that concept of obligation to future generations is, is uh, held by most, um, most cultures around the world. But yet, the fact is, so here's, here's my, uh, my son's first child, uh, Jake, and their second child, uh, Emma, Laura, Lauren, Jake is uh, two and a half years old. He's, uh, he's very large for his age. He's in the top 1%. He may be two meters high when he grows up, according to the believe long extrapolations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he thinks that he can protect his baby sister. Who, uh, but what Jake doesn't know is that he, we're, we're probably, or we're in the process of leaving a situation which is going to be um, out, of, out of their control. And now here's uh, Jake's baby sister at age seven months. You can see she's pretty serious and she's already wondering about what sort of situation we're leaving. So her cousin, 
uh, Sophie, who's now uh, in this photo, is 12 years old. She's now getting close to 13. But she decided she's writing a letter to President Obama. And uh, you can tell from the look on her face that she uh, thinks I'm going to like her letter. <laughs> because, among other things, she says, why don't you listen to my grandfather? <laughs> so here we are celebrating her letter. Um, now let me end on a couple of notes of optimism. Um, China, I think, they... I was in China several months ago, and it seems clear to me that they do not, first of all, they don't deny the science. They accept that, and the country is basically run by engineers. And they are now making enormous investments in clean energy. And they're now number one in producing solar panels, in producing windmills, and they're building 30 nuclear power plants. Um, so I, we're, we're going to have to uh, take a look at that, uh, or we're going to soon end up as a second-rate second, second rate nation if, uh, if we don't start uh, doing some of those things ourselves. But the other thing is there's uh, potential for a legal approach. Um, I argue that in our Declaration of Independence, it first starts out saying all people are created equal. And then in the Constitution, there's the, on the basis of that concept, there's the uh, equal protection of the laws, which is, was used in the case of civil rights to, for the courts to tell the executive branch of the government it needs to enforce uh, equal opportunity and, um, in the schools and other places. Um, so, Hopefully, uh, the judicial branch will be willing to look at this um, issue because there is a precedent for uh, the concept that the atmosphere and climate and the planet are really held as a public trust for uh, future generations. And uh, they may be able to uh, force the government to begin to take uh, some of the steps to stabilize um, climate. And uh, you can read some of the things I've written about this on these websites. Thanks. from the audience. Dr. Hansen would be happy to entertain them. Please speak up very loudly so that uh, everybody can hear, and I'll ask Dr. Hansen to repeat questions as well. Question in the back? Yes, go ahead. Let me know if you can hear me. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for a uh, compelling framing of, of uh, the challenges that face us, as well as leaving us with some sense of optimism in how we can act as individuals. Since this is a community of, of physics educators and physics teachers, I appreciate your thoughts about what roles we might serve in that capacity and whether and how we might use this as a mechanism to teach about the environment that we're living in, perhaps through physics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, I, it's really important for the public to understand that science basically is uh, objectivity. I mean, it's, you know, what we hear in Congress and other places is, well, do you believe in global warming or not? <laughs> it's, you know, Galileo, in the time of Galileo, it was, uh, true that the, the church could uh, could enforce the doctrine that that the sun when it was revolving around the earth 
as a matter of belief, and force Galileo to say that it was true, well, we should, we're not in that situation now. We don't have to, to have things decided based on beliefs. But, so we have to, to somehow, the public doesn't understand how science works. So basically, we need to uh, try to, and, and that probably 